Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jarko Cvej. I'm Vice Dean for International Cooperation here at the Faculty of Media and Communication. And it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to this conference and to our school. Uh, why the post-digital age? Post-digital age, not in terms of somehow transcending the digital or overcoming the digital or reverting into um, some long-lost non-digital or pre-digital past, which would be impossible anyway. But post-digital in terms of the digital pervading and uh, becoming so deeply ingrained in our civilization, in our culture, in the way we live, that our lives would be impossible without it. In more concrete terms, the digital and the screen as its paradigm and increasingly the main, if not the only way we um, um, interact and mediate our reality um, is uh, fast becoming the norm, uh, is pervading and uh, informing um, every major aspect of the way we live. For instance, politics, the way our um, representative democracies and their institutions work, or rather don't work, um, our marketing and business models, the way they seek to improve our lives, but also increasingly to direct and shape them, non-digital and digital alike. The way our media um, services, public and private media services, inform, but also increasingly misinform us. In more, uh, crucially, uh, the digital has imposed a new epistemology on us, a new way of knowing and interacting um, with the world around us. Um, and as such, it demands new transdisciplinary ways of conceptualizing them. Now that being the case, and our faculty, as usual, striving to ask the most urgent and pressing questions and broach um, the most pressing topics, we've come together today. We've brought um, a number of leading scholars and experts in the field from Serbia and abroad to discuss these issues with us today. Um, in, a, in an age and in a part of the world that, um, where the digital has brought not only liberation but also and, and more livable lives, but also increasingly um, a lack of privacy and uh, a society of total control, we thought that those issues were well discussing, well worth discussing. So. Um, today, I hope by the end of the, t of, of the day, we'll be at least a little bit smarter and uh, a little bit better equipped to grapple with those challenges of this post-digital age. So I wish you all a pleasant and, above all, a useful conference. Thank you. Good morning from me, too. I wish you a warm welcome to the Faculty of Media and Communication. As a Vice Dean for Student Affairs, I'm always thinking about students and their study programs, and I am usually listening to their wishes, aspirations, problems too. So whenever we are having this kind of, or any kind of event, uh, I'm always thinking about how it can benefit students and how it can motivate them really to go further on their professional path. So I'm very proud today to say that among you full professionals, we are also having lots of students, both uh, within the participant body and also within the organizational team. So I want to thank them especially for that. And I think that we should be particularly mindful about these fresh minds and brains because those who are just going into the post-digital, as post-digital studies and carrying all the experience that they already have as millennials, I think that we can also learn a lot from them and from their questions. So I want to encourage them to ask questions. And I want to encourage all of you to use that opportunity for a dialogue to unify these different generations, different viewpoints, and really to be active and to use this conference for further contacts, ideas, and new perspectives for the future. So thank you all. And now I'll now ask Lazar Jamic, who will lead you through the conference, to introduce the guests. Thank you. 
Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much to Jarko and Dragana for uh, fantastic thoughts that actually led us into, into the day. So I've got an enormous pleasure and privilege to be emceeing, uh, without music though, uh, emceeing the, the, the proceedings today. And uh, just to mention, we are live streaming on Instagram. The hashtag for everything we do today is uh, post digital FMK. So just for you to get to know, live streaming on Instagram. Um, there's going to be a live, there is a live uh, YouTube streaming room just for this building, not uh, from the outside. And I have to start with saying, um, we are so enormously privileged and, and, and happy that you are here, guys. And we actually have uh, an opportunity to really listen kind of to people who are leading in many kind of these, these new fields. Uh, but this would ha wouldn't have happened without a, an enormous effort and the energy, first of all, the, the formidable energy of our Dean, Nada Popovic Perisic, but also uh, Simona Zikic, uh, the pr uh, video and production team, event production team, other faculty, and an absolutely amazing hard work of many of our students, like very intrepid people who helped us put this uh, um, uh, together today. So I would just kind of like to ask you for a kind of big, big applause for all of them who actually made it happen. Thank you. Um, so yes, um, some people actually asked us about the title of the conference, like post-digital, and I, I always kind of, uh, remembered my first conversation uh, last year in London with my ex-Google colleagues. So we're kind of having drinks, having dinner, and then some of them actually started naturally, casually, talking about post-digital. And I was like, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. What are you on about? How can you talk about post-digital in the world that is completely digital? And said, exactly. It's completely digital. We don't need a new word for it anymore. It's not something that is separate from the rest of the life. Like you've got digital and you've got the rest of the life. Everything is digital now. We don't need the word digital anymore. And I was really, really taken aback. I actually did, did see sense in that. That kind of inspired the title of the conference. Do you remember the E word? We had E business. Where's that E now? It doesn't exist anymore, right? Everything is E. In the same way that particularly in the developed countries, everything is digital. So it's almost like we don't need the word anymore. But that doesn't mean that digital doesn't exist, of course. The effects and the, the consequences and the opportunities as well are enormous. And we're going to be hearing about some of those today. So it gives me kind of great pleasure to um, uh, introduce our first keynote speaker for today. I had, uh, again, a very, very rare privilege to join um, Des Friedman uh, in the Lord Putnam's inquiry into the future of the public broadcast services, i.e. the BBC in the digital age. Read how to save <laughs> the BBC, basically. Uh, which he was coordinating and driving. And it was, uh, for me, it was an awe-inspiring experience, I have to say. Not just because of the kind of quality of the thinking, but also because of Des's uh, passion uh, for, for, for the world with lots of trust and more trust, and I would say honesty in media as well. So Des is not just a leading media academic, he's an activist as well. He feels passionately about all these things. And to kickstart the, the day today, uh, that is going to take us through um, uh, one interesting thing. What is the revolution in the digital revolution? So um, I give you, as the first keynote for today, uh, Professor Des Friedman from the Goldsmiths University of London. Des, please. Ten to ten? Okay, just so I know where I am. Right. Well, good morning again to everybody. Um, and it is a, uh, a pleasure to be here, um, escaping from the major political chaos, that is uh, your foreign minister's phrase, for what is going on in the UK, um, and where he may be tongue-in-cheek, maybe not, advised all of you not to visit the UK because there is too much turmoil um, taking place there. So it's lovely to escape that turmoil and to come to such a calm, relaxed, um, place where there are no demonstrations at all, maybe one tomorrow and for however many months previously. But anyway, um, of course, actually having turmoil or demonstrations, depending on your point of view, may be an expression of uh, democratic vitality. Um, we will see tomorrow, I guess. Uh, it may be an expression of a vigorous democracy. And I do want, as a sort of theme of this talk, to try and think about um, some of those issues around what a democratic communications system may be like and some of the problems that we face. But I do want to start just by thanking Lazar, Jaco, uh, Darko, uh, Zarko, Simona and everyone else 
for organizing the event, for inviting me and um, all the other international guests here, for launching a, a much needed conversation about the impact of the digital on media worlds and practices. Um, I don't really want to thank, in particular, Lazar for putting me first, because as you will find out by the end of the day, I'm the worst person to kick off an event on post-digital, partly because I know the least about the digital. I promise that's not me just being uh, disingenuous. Um, it's also because I do have a problem um, with posts. So I want to revisit some of those uh, uh, the introductory comments as well um, about what it means to be thinking about the, the post-digital. So let me just go over some of the, the ground that Lazar and others were, just, were, were, were thinking about. Because most often, despite the very sophisticated ways in which you introduced it, the post is often seen in quite a temporal way. It's often used as a way of thinking that it refers to a stage uh, where we have superseded something that is now almost obsolete. It's quite a stubborn way of looking um, at it. So we have phrases like, easy phrases like, I don't know, post-war, or perhaps in some distant future, in my case, post-Brexit, if we ever reach such a place. They may have a, tem a, a certain temporal logic, but of course it's very difficult, if not impossible, to insulate the present and the future from what has happened before. Um, I would say that the past is always present in our current conjunctures. But obviously, again, as you've, as you've heard from people introducing this session and from the text accompanying this, this event, we can use this prefix to suggest something that is not temporal, but much more, I believe, contextual. Um, so it refers to a new condition of life in which uh, we haven't gone beyond something, but really are instead fully circumscribed by it or, or within it. Um, and I think this is what my colleagues, uh, Joanna Zielinska and Sarah Kemba, mean in their book, In Life After New Media. That is not post-new media. That is in the context of well, and utterly submerged within a digital environment. They are arguing that the mediation facilitated by the digital world is actually the water that we swim in, is the... Uh, the air that we breathe, as they put it, our being in and becoming with the technological world. So let me, and I don't know if this is a ridiculous diversion, but bear with me. In fact, bear with me for the next 40 minutes. Um, why don't we just take post-colonialism as an example? Uh, we have lots of debates. I don't know what the debates are um, here in, uh, in Serbia, about, in, in Belgrade about this. But post-colonialism is, a, we have all sorts of programs um, at Goldsmiths um, around this, all sorts of very live debates. But how do we understand something like post-colonialism? Does it refer to a specific historical period, in other words, the period after decolonization? So perhaps you, know, you can put a date on it from the 1960s and so on. But obviously, that is problematic to many people because we clearly, for them, have not gone beyond colonial conditions, colonial circumstances. In fact, as I speak, there is an occupation. Do you still have occupations anymore? It's a very old-fashioned. We have an occupation of the administration at Goldsmiths right now over, in many ways, what they argue is the continuing colonial structures um, of, of higher education at Goldsmiths um, and beyond. So uh, clearly we haven't gone for, that, for, for the occupiers beyond colonialism. Or maybe post-colonial refers to something different, to something more epistemological, to a mindset, to a determination instead to understand and to challenge colonial structures uh, and, and conditions. So as Homi Baba once put it, post-colonial refers to, in his words, a form of social criticism that bears witness to those unequal and uneven processes of representation by which the historical experience of the once colonized third world comes to be framed in the West. So it's both a temporal but also a critical project when we, when we uh, study uh, uh, and when we engage with post-colonialism. This is something that was also commented on by Stuart Hall. I, I teach, I should say. I always have to mention Stuart Hall because my office building is the Professor Stuart Hall building, so I feel I have no other option, but always to put him into my talks. And he, he picks up on um, some of these questions in a really interesting article. Oh, you can't see the first word, but he asked the question, when was 
the post-colonial? Well, maybe we should probably ask, when was the post-digital, if you want to look at it like that? Um, and he, he argues that post-colonialism can be seen as the subverting of the old colonizing slash colonized binary. And he sees it as the continuing ways in which imperial power continues, not that we've gone beyond it, but it continues to produce highly racialized subjects. And so it's highly relevant to this day, as long as it's understood not simply as a distant historical epoch that we have somehow superseded or gone beyond, but something that is part of our contemporary conjuncture. Now, I think we can see traces of these arguments, these tensions, in so many other posts. So, um, I mean, I, if I had time, I would make this an audience response and ask you to give me your favorite posts. But does anyone remember the idea of a post-racial society? Um, so we had, uh, it wasn't that long ago, that we had President Obama um, was allegedly going to usher in or was the expression of a post-racial age in the US. Now that dream was ended actually not by Trump's association with white supremacism, then with a much more boring fact that Trump's, that Trump, sorry, that Obama's administration um, in the end wasn't really able to do that much materially speaking to end racism. Um, Post-feminism something that we talk about all the time um, at Goldsmiths. It can hardly be seen as a successor to, to feminism when uh, the Me Too movement actually emerged on its watch. So we clearly um, have not gone beyond or post-feminism. And given that I teach about this, please don't even get me started on post-modernism when uh, struggles, as I see it, for modernity, for things like equality, universality, self-determination, and so on, all of these remain aspirations that continue to preoccupy us. So in an age of posts, we are nowhere near beyond colonialism, feminism, race, modernity, or obviously the digital. Instead, we are inscribed embedded in societies in which they continue to make their mark. So the question is not about being pre or post or just thinking where are we temporally in, 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 question, in a relation to time, but about how these processes make their mark and about how we understand their interactions with other social forces. Um, and I think there is one particularly central reoccurring way uh, in which we seek to understand the impact of the digital. And that is, for me, and I hope I'm not making this up, um, through the language of revolution, um, which has accompanied discussions of technology from, well, for as long as anyone can remember. And I think today it's very hard to think about um, uh, any significant technological development without hearing of or speaking about revolution. It's just our, it, it seems to me the most um, uh, popular metaphor for seeking to understand the impact of the digital on the world in which we live. So anything like you know, development in AI that I know Andrew's gonna talk about, it's always an AI revolution, um, a biotech revolution, a nanotechnology revolution. Um, uh, and I think you have many, many different examples of this. They all add up to what Cloud calls the fourth industrial revolution, which in a way is a very temporal way of looking at it, because then you have to say, when was the first, the second, the third, and when will be the fifth? So I'm a bit suspicious about all of this, but you know, I'm sure in that fine book there is a way of, uh, of uh, locating what he so confidently calls the fourth industrial revolution. But you know, we have revolutions in all areas of, of, uh, of daily life, of everyday life, which have been ushered in, facilitated by uh, digital technology. So revolutions in everything, in shopping, obviously, in marketing, in banking, education, medicine, journalism, you name it. But for me, this begs the question, um, and it, it is a source of some frustration, actually, when I try to have polite arguments with people about this, it makes me ask, well, what do people understand by a revolution? So forgive me being rather simplistic, but maybe sometimes being simplistic helps put that debate out in, on the table in front of us. So um, a simple way of thinking about this is that revolution really have two essential <coughs> ways and quite distinctive ways of um, two distinctive sets of meaning. So one is related to physical movement, the idea of things turning round. Um, Lazar said that I should throw in 
some uh, uh, examples which are of interest to younger people in the room. So the best I could do was to put in a record player. Because <laughs> I know that every, everyone under 21 now has to have a record player. So there is revolutions per minute is how we used to, from 70, it's interesting the world is slowing down because it used to be 78 revolutions per minute, now we've gone down to 33, so this is concerning. So you have the idea of revolutions in terms of movement itself, but you also have, forgive me for such a stereotyped image, um, a different uh, notion of revolution, one that is related to fundamental structural social change. Um, as the American political scientist Theda Scopo argues, social revolution refers to the, quote, rapid basic transformation of a society, state, and class structure, accompanied and in part accomplished through popular revolts from below. So quite a distinctive um, take from just the sheer element of things turning around or things changing. Um, now, both of these uh, definitions... So... As in with much of I do, if I'm confused about something, I turn to this wonderful book by Raymond Williams called Keywords that I hope some of you know. So there are many different examples of, of keywords, but he did one of the first keywords um, uh, from A to Z, looking at the, the terms of social theory that we need to get to grips with. And in his understanding of revolution, he argues that both of these definitions have always um, coexisted reflecting on the rise of broadcasting, and I think this is such a great quote, he says that the transistor, that really is not a, a word for younger people, but um, you know, this, just pretend it's the electronics, in fact, pretend it's the digital revolution, might seem a loose or trivial <coughs> phrase to someone who has taken the full weight of the sense of social revolution, and a technological or second, or indeed third or fourth, revolution might seem merely, and I love this, polemical or distracting descriptions. Yet the history of the world supports each kind of use. So what does the digital revolution um, uh, refer to? Now, this is the kind of thing, I could get billions of just random slides from, for, uh, you know, off the web, but lots of them have this kind of image, which is, I think, conflating both the idea of just things turning around and a sense of, you know, the fist of social change um, facilitated through the smartphone in this case. But, you know, let's ask, what does the, the digital revolution refer to? Is it merely, as Raymond Williams is putting it, a polemical or distracting way of speaking about recent innovations, or does it suggest something far more profound? Now, of course, at one level, obviously, it, ref it speaks to changes in processing and computational power that have facilitated drastically new forms of production, distribution, and consumption, drastically new forms of doing business, drastically new forms of living, things that, that uh, my esteemed colleagues are going to speak about for the rest of the day. Um, but to what extent do does it involve a transformation of the existing relations of power? To what extent has it helped as Scopel puts it, to transform class material structures. To what extent has it fostered a new informational mode of production and new types of social relations that are distinct than, uh, from those um, that it supersedes? And I remain pretty unconvinced about this latter um, element of uh, the revolutionary nature of the digital revolution. I'm not unconvinced about the scale of change, so please, I don't know if you have the word Luddite here, but I am not a Luddite. I am in awe of, but very interested in examining the consequences of digital possibilities. So I, I fully appreciate, even if I don't understand, the implications of, um, uh, of a platform society, for example. But what I'm seeking to do is to draw out a distinction between the scale of change and the type of change that we are seeing. And for me, I see really the continuing place of the powerful in relation to the powerless, even in a digital world. The post-digital world contains the same concentrations of power, the same organizing principles, the same inequalities, the same possibilities, the same social problems as the pre-digital, despite the huge changes that are taking place. So how about another, and it's a very old-fashioned, you couldn't get a more old-fashioned description of a social revolution than going back nearly 100 years to, to, to Lenin. So this is a very famous dis, uh, description of a, 
of a revolution, sorry, it looks really long, doesn't it? But for a revolution to take place, it's not enough for the exploited and oppressed masses to realize the impossibility of living in the old way and demand changes. For a revolution, so just think about this in terms of the digital, for a revolution to take place, it's essential that the exploiters should not be able to live and rule in the, in the old way. It is only when the lower classes do not want to live in the old way and the upper classes can't carry on in the old way that the revolution triumph. Now what's interesting in that quote is that for, for, for Lenin the revolution isn't about the names of the people, whether there are new names or not, or new roles. The revolution is about whether exploitation, as he puts it, continues to take place or not. It's not whether there are new people using new tools to do the same things. And again, I throw that out there as a means of just contextualizing the way in which we think of the life-changing, but what is the consequences of these life-changing technologies that we are all grappling with. So it's not about whether change takes place, but about the kind of change and whether this is change that is democratically um, uh, controlled from below or imposed from above. Now, wherever you stand in this debate about what kind of revolution is the digital revolution, it seems to me that this idea of the revolutionary potential of the digital in particular has, has always been with us. It's, been, it's part of the very genealogy um, of, of the internet. It has long populated book titles, as, as I say, PowerPoint slides forever and ever. So let me just seize on one influential writer called, uh, well, she was influential 20 years ago. Uh, but Esther Dyson, she is still influential now. Is she influential now? Uh, she's influential now because of ICANN. She was one of the main uh, voices um, in ICANN, the organization that continues to assign domain names. So she has an important role. And this is just a typical account, I would say, of how people understood this, you know, back in the 90s, what was a, a very new uh, medium. The internet will... Uh, change all, our, all of our lives. It will suck power away from central governments, mass media, and big business. Even now, the net extends across and transcends traditional, um, uh, traditional what? Where am I? Traditional national boundaries, and it overcomes distance. Now, um, this is a very, I think, uh, uh, um, not an untypical account of the potential of the internet as it was seen then, that it's empowering and it's decentralized structures, that it's revolutionary, it's social impact, it's unprecedented in the speed and the consequences of, of how it is overturning everything that is near and dear to us. Now, of course, parts of this are very true, but parts of this um, are, are, I would say, not so true, certainly in terms of uh, destroying big business when, as you will have noticed, the six biggest companies in the world, the last time I looked, forgive me if it has changed overnight, but the six biggest business are, uh, businesses in the world are all tech companies, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, Facebook, and Alibaba. But there's something that's more interesting about this. So what do you, would you guess is my favorite word, one word in that quote? Suck. Interesting, but wrong. Well, I mean, you're right, but it's not my favorite word. It's a great word, and it suggests something very powerful. So suck. No one has ever said suck before, but yeah. Okay. Any, anything else? Power. power. Well, all right. I am, as you know, interested in power. But no, I don't think it's used in a very interesting way here. In fact, it's used in a very descriptive way. Keep going. I'm going to stay here till 11 o'clock. Transcend. transcend. Why would I be interested in transcendence? Well, come. You can talk about transcendence. Media. No, we will go on. Think smaller. No, who said the? That great answer. I, I'm with you on that. It isn't my answer, but the, I would struggle to think of how that's good. No, it's will. It's will. It's this idea that nothing can stop these things happening. It's the sheer inevitability that these innovations will, despite anything that humans may or may not do, have these impacts, which clearly some of them are not true, but some of them are true. So for me, what's really interested in the theness or the willness of all of this is a sense of uh, technological determinism that I think, and I love this slide, sorry, it's just pulled off the web, but I like it because it's so sunny and happy, which I think has all sorts of problems associated with it of how we understand uh, technological innovation. Right, so, um, oh, I've spent about half of, okay, I need to speed up a little bit. Um, so, um, 
for me, I, I'm very interested in the idea of how we speak about technology and this kind of technological determinism. Now, first of all, this isn't something to do with the digital. Deterministic discourses have been with us, again, for a, for a very long time. And in fact, we see what's so interesting is we see precisely the same accounts of social transformation going back into, for example, the 19th century. There's a fantastic book um, I recommend Tom Standage's book on the Victorian internet, looking at telegraphy and telecommunications. In fact, you know, if you were to, to, to uh, force me to say one of the most revolutionary developments, which is because I wouldn't want you to put the question like that, but I would probably say the 19th century. I mean, I might say, in terms of women's lives, I would say that the, the, the washing machine in the 20th century is a far more revolutionary technology than the internet. But I, but I wouldn't want to give you that answer, so please don't, don't ask me. But anyway, um, uh, Stanger says, uh, in his words, in the 1880s, advocates of electricity claimed that it would eliminate the drudgery of manual work and create a world of abundance and peace. In the first decade of the 20th century, aircraft inspired similar flights of fancy, rapid intercontinental travel on whiz, on easy jet. That, he didn't say that, but that's what we're talking about. Um, would, uh, was claimed that it would eliminate international misunderstandings. Right, that hasn't gone so well. Uh, similarly, television was expected to improve education, reduce social isolation, enhance democracy. Nuclear power was supposed to usher in uh, an age of plenty where electricity would be too cheap to meter. The optimistic claims now being made about the internet are merely the most recent examples of a tradition of technological utopianism that goes back to the first transatlantic telegraph cables 150 years ago. Um, now, I, I'm not a business scholar or an economist. I am a humble social scientist, but I do start from a different perspective than the deterministic accounts because I'm just as excited about the innovations that surround us, but I don't start, and I don't think we should start, from the internal properties of a technology, but from the outside because from my perspective, the emergence of communication technologies isn't a natural, inevitable process, but one that takes place in specific political, historical, technological, uh, uh, um, cultural contexts. Um, and I think it's very important that we just all the time try and demystify some of these claims and put these technological innovations into their context. As uh, my colleague James Curran likes to say, uh, that it's not so much that the internet has changed the world, but that the world has changed the internet. I think that's a more uh, uh, useful way of, 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 of understanding the internet itself. So I've got about 20 minutes, have I, to, is that right? You're supposed to be chairing me. 20 minutes, right. Um, to, to, to do two things. One is to warn us, as if, I don't know, maybe none of you need any warning, um, about the, uh, the dangers of determinism. Dangers is probably too strong a word, but anyway, how we should be critical of determinism. And then also to, uh, uh, to, to argue that we need to find ways of uh, making the digital work, as I would argue, um, with my activist hat on, uh, in the public interest, to find democratic forms of regulation and democratic uses of public media. So let me very quickly start with um, a discussion of um, uh, technological determinism. So this is, again, just to, to see that it's a, it's a view of the world, or a view of technology, I, say, I should argue, where it's seen as developing independently, to a certain extent, from political and social context. Um, it's the idea that technologies produce social change. Um, as Raymond Williams summarizes it in his wonderful book, so my other Bible, I have two Bibles, keywords and this book, if you want, I think, somewhat polemically, if you want to understand what is going on in 2019, read this very old book on television, technology and cultural form. And he argues um, that the con deterministic conception is quote, that the steam engine, the automobile, television, the atomic bomb, all of these have made modern man, and I would add woman, and the modern condition. That it is technologies in and of themselves that have produced the modern age. And of course the problem is, well there are many problems, but one of the major problems is that it evacuates agency. It evacuates um, human agency from the, the equation. Just as if we think about um, uh, social revolutions themselves, according to Chalmers Johnson, he argues that social revolutions are forms of human behavior. That is, they're not something analogous to earthquakes or sunspots. Although even then, we know that even the most natural disaster has very human, you know, in, in the age of, uh, of climate change, um, natural disasters are not so natural anymore. But anyway, technology is, as, as Raymond Williams argues, uh, always in a full sense social. 
So that for me is some, how many words is that? One, two, three, about eight, eight really important words that a technology is always in a full sense social. And what Williams does, which I think is very useful, is he distinguishes between, um, have I got this? Yeah, he distinguishes between two things, technique and technology. Technique, or as he puts it, technical invention. In other words, the application of particular skills where, where you find them, I don't know, in this faculty, in Silicon Valley garages and basements and so on. He distinguishes between that and the social institution of the technology. And he's really interested in how an invention, in his words, becomes an available technology. He's much more interested in, in, in a way, the socialization of the invention, because these things can go lots of different ways. Radio didn't come for us. Sorry, once again, I'm failing abysmally to actually talk about 21st century things. But radio was, did not come to us in the form in which we receive it now. It, there was an argument for many years about should it be much more on a kind of pirate radio, decentralized point-to-point -point structure, or should it be the kind of radio top-down top structures that are more associated with it. So the move from a technical invention to an available technology is a product of human argument, of uh, uh, um, not an inevitable one. So far from a technique unraveling alone its own internal logic, it's, it, it's shaped by the behavior of real individuals in particular uh, historical circumstances. And for, for Williams, um, uh, technology is a relationship. It is, in his words, necessarily in complex and variable connection with other social relations and institutions. Um, and I was, but I won't now because of time, the way he talks about broadcasting uh, as you know, subject to all these particular battles and how its shape really fitted the needs of, the, of capitalism in the 1930s. He talks about, oh, you, none of you can see it at the bottom there, but mobile privatization. Um, the, the, t the broadcasting fitted the needs of, of particular um, forms of Western capitalism. And I'm hoping that we have these sorts of questions that we apply now to digital innovations as well, instead of just accepting them as a fait accompli. The, in a way, the bigger question is, um, how do we make digital work for the public? So let me use my remaining minutes on, on this, if I can. I have a feeling that the organizers wanted me just to speak about public service broadcasting, so I'm really doing badly, but I will come back to public service media at the end, unless I'm kicked out. 15 more, right, okay. Um, so yeah, for me the key question is how we use our imagination, our power, um, uh, and our networks uh, to do things differently, how we should best deploy um, all these amazing innovations, not just in the sense of, of a business logic, not just to secure profits, not just to improve efficiency of labor or to raise productivity, but how do we materially improve the lives of the majority of humanity by making available these wonderful digital uh, innovations. And I think this will require coordination and intervention, not only by governments seeking political advantage, not only by commercial enterprises um, whose job is effectively overall to make money, but I think through democratic arrangements that we will have to develop through open and transparent forms of regulation that work in the public interest. And of course, this is a huge and very complex argument. Um, so I wanted to give two examples for this. One is around algorithms, one is around public media. So why don't we just start just by oh, moving on See, from one very old looking slide to a much more contemporary slide. Um, let's think about how we should respond to the challenges and opportunities presented by algorithms, because we live, as Frank Pasquale has put it, in a black box society in which proprietary algorithms are increasingly used to organize major parts of public life, including systems of policing, healthcare, insurance, entertainment, uh, uh, news, marketing, and so on. So the supporters, if you can bracket them all together, um, uh, the optimists, um, uh, insist that algorithms are more fair, more reliable than human judgment that is, of course, susceptible to emotion and partisanship. Their opponents, on the other hand, suggest that they replicate and embed existing asymmetries and, and discriminatory practices inside allegedly neutral systems of evaluation. So in this context, algorithmic bias, the extension of pre-existing prejudices into machine learning environments, 
uh, is fast becoming, I think, one of the most, you know, the, the, one of the most controversial uh, topical issues, it, both inside academia, uh, but also within uh, uh, government um, as well. And if you start from the premise that the only thing that machine learning knows about the world is the data that is fed to it, then at one level you can argue this accounts for its power to a certain extent in that any problem that can be cast in a suitable numerical form can be tackled by the general family of machine learning algorithms. And it doesn't matter whether the data represents house prices or terrorism suspects, um, as anything in, princ in principle can be turned into data, can be data scienced. But at the same time, I would argue that this is a major problem because with the input of data, we sweep in all the potential biases that lie behind its construction as data in the first place. So if the data is distorted by social prejudice, then that is the pattern that the algorithm will learn. And you only have to consider for a moment the way that algorithms powering, for example, predictive policing systems are trained on historical arrest and crime data. And so they accumulate all the individual and cultural decisions about who to target for investigation and arrest. And if, if there is, that, and it's not a very big if, because there is discrimination embedded in the data, then our machines will come to think our prejudice, prejudices for us. And if those mechanical judgments are then used to target future activity, we have the technological reproduction of social discrimination. Also, machine learning brings with it another characteristic which can cause harm, I, I would argue, which is the very opaque nature excuse me, of its decision making, because it's not called a black box for, for, for no reason. We genuinely do not know uh, what goes on inside the box. So I think one of the basic things we should be calling for, when we call for, as I'm sure you are doing here, for more media accountability, we also should be calling for an accountability in terms of these very opaque algorithms. We need to open up the boxes and look inside. So I think we need to be calling for algorithmic audits for impact assessments that ensure greater accountability for citizens and the opportunity for user groups, for publics, for, uh, for public agencies to evaluate and, if necessary, modify the algorithms that are used in evaluating us, in, in evaluating our credit ratings, criminal records, academic achievements and news consumption. I'm sure that Mara is going to touch on some of this in, uh, in, in, her, in her talk later on. And we're actually starting to see some of these impact um, assessments <coughs> Uh, used in a variety of contexts around the world. I know in New York they were talking, the Data and Society project was talking about having some forms of algorithmic accountability um, in, in, New York, in New York City uh, in terms of public services. Um, uh, recent events in relation to Facebook and Cambridge Analytica demonstrate the lack of transparency of the most influential algorithmic systems and again point to the urgency of developing legal, political, organizational responses that will subject these very powerful tools to public scrutiny. And given the huge outcry, public uh, um, uh, and, and from within politics, outcry against so-called fake news and disinformation, I would say now that regulation um, is, is far more likely. I mean, there is an almost unstoppable wave um, uh, towards regulation um, uh, 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 to, to, to minimize the ability um, of these um, unaccountable forces to, I don't know, shape election. That's my life. Um, so I think we're going to see regulation um, emerge in the next few years. But we need to make sure that the regulation, that we get the regulation right. Because my worry is um, that we need to make sure that the principles and mechanisms underpinning any future regulatory activity draw on the most democratic and accountable forms of oversight rather than ones that are simply captured by business or the state. And I am really worried about that because at the moment it seems to me that the forms of regulation that are most likely to be drawn up will be drawn up in conjunction with Facebook and in conjunction with Google and will actually embed further forms of inequality um, and discrimination uh, inside, uh, inside these systems. So in discussions around, for example, fake news, we really don't want governments to introduce legislation as a short-term panic measure that would just criminalize content that they designate as controversial or, uh, um, but is simply unpopular with authorities. 
um, but perhaps not always content that is in itself purposefully designed to deceive. So we're going to have to get this regulation right. It's going to have to be proportionate and effective uh, and not partisan. So in other words, we have to preserve and extend the creative possibilities that are at the heart of these extremely disruptive technologies um, and make sure it is done for the benefit of publics and citizens. If we, we hear a lot about walls. Forgive me for returning to the, to the US. We hear a lot about walls at the moment. And I do believe there are some walls that we should build, not the walls that keep out Mexican uh, uh, um, uh, people trying to look for a better life, um, not walls that actually uh, protect private spaces from the public, but I think walls quite the other way around. I think we need walls that perhaps moderate the impact of market forces, walls that protect public spaces and private transactions from the huge levels of intrusion and surveillance that we're seeing at the moment. That again, we want to see transparent and publicly accountable algorithms serving the public instead of the mysterious ones that currently dominate. So we want to have platforms that facilitate meaningful forms um, of connection um, and that are based not on exploiting our personal data or allowing us to be targeted by snoopers in the security services, we want search engines that don't just prioritize their own services on the front page, but provide us with impartial, comprehensive information. We want social media platforms that don't just commodify our individuality and sell us to advertisers without our clear permission. We want these platforms to treat us as citizens with, with rights to privacy, not least. Um, so this is going to be, those are the principles I argue that should underpin any future forms of regulation. Um, so what are the th um, um, other sorts of things I think are fairly obvious to do is to have a, a new discussion about antitrust and to challenge to have an antitrust policy, an anti-monopoly policy um, that actually breaks up some of the largest concentrations of power. Of course, in my area of looking at journalism, this has been extremely uh, concerning because vast majority of digital advertising money, of course, goes to just two companies and has made it all but impossible for the legacy uh, 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 media to carry on in the old way. Some people say that's not a bad thing, but of course, this has been incredibly damaging um, for, uh, for, for, the, for the legacy media. So in my last few minutes, I've talked about private power and the need to try and regulate some of the largest private concerns. What about public media? What role can public media have in terms um, of uh, helping us to regain the trust that we are losing? Now, I say that backed up by data. You can't read any of this, but I can. So I would suggest, and you are not alone, that there is a problem with trust in, uh, in, in Serbia. Um, now, uh, league tables, it's very nice to know that, you, that in these particular league tables around trust, uh, Serbia is doing better than the UK. But that's only because the UK is doing so badly. But it's very interesting that in Serbia, so this is a... Um, uh, EB, European Broadcasting Union, uh, um, very big um, surveys on trust. And trust in the internet, Serbia is, is here. So you're in the middle. You're not doing badly. It's quite high level. It's still a mi only a minority. That's something like 39% of Serbian citizens uh, have trust in the internet. What's very interesting is those levels tr drop dramatically because this is the bottom, by the way, not the top. So apart from Macedonia, Serbians trust the radio the least across the whole of Europe. Um, and when it comes to trust in the written press, which I am, I don't know if proud is the right word to say, but the UK comes bottom. Um, uh, again, Macedonia and Serbia. So, so we have a lot in common, I think, our two countries. Though there is a problem with the legacy media, and I would say, uh, uh, extrapolating from that, with systems of public communication more generally. We, have, we are losing our trust. So something needs to be done. And of course, the question is, in what ways can digital platforms be part of the solution as opposed to just reinforcing existing um, uh, prejudices? Now, um, I my um, first conclusion is that the mere invocation of public media is not a solution in itself. Just saying we should have a public media doesn't, doesn't do it for me because that begs the question of, what constitutes a genuinely public media system. So as Lazar mentioned, I was the project lead for this uh, big inquiry in the UK into the future of public service television where I was really thinking about these things and because I'm running out of time, I will just 
uh, sketch out five minutes, I'll just sketch out, the, for me, some of the conclusions. Um, there are those people who are saying, actually, that public service media, or public media in general, are a rather 20th century conception um, of media systems in a digital age. And we found very much, having talked to many people inside the industry, civil society groups, um, and our own analysis, that this is by no means the case. And actually, what you find instead is a discrepancy between the continuing and relevant values of public service, of independence, universality, citizenship, and diversity, and the ability of specific public media operations to realize them. So the UK may not suffer from the same levels of unwarranted intervention into its public media as, for example, to Poland and Hungary, but neither, even in the UK, with its very long and established um, system of public media, the UK is not immune from political pressure and elite, uh, elite identification in such a way that we argue that it compromises its mission to meaningfully serve publics without fear or favour. There are, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, significant criticisms of the BBC from within Britain. Maybe it has a much, in fact, it does have a much better reputation outside Britain for, for obvious reasons. Um, but there have been criticisms of its hiring policies, of its centralization, of its, indeed, its commitment to impartiality. Even last week, the, uh, the Director General, Lord Hall, Tony Hall, who's not a man who is open to that much self-criticism, admitted that public perception of the BBC's impartiality had, in his own words, weakened in recent years because of its uh, failure to really get to grips with the volatility of British politics. So we found that public service principles were just as relevant for the digital age as they were before. The question is, how do you find the tools to leverage these principles into the digital age? This is, again, something that is absolutely critical. And I think one of the answers is that the public has to be part of that conversation. This cannot be something that is done on behalf of passive publics. One of the, um, our recommendations um, was, uh, which, which has found a small audience um, uh, inside the British uh, community, was for a series of digital innovation grants that you should have a levy, a small levy, on some of the biggest aggregators, um, on the biggest intermediaries, and feed that money back into non profits um, who have a lot of stories to tell. It could be museums, it could be universities, it could be local, um, uh, local um, hyper-local startups who really don't have a secure business model, that they should be the ones whose voices, because of digital possibilities, could be leveraged into this new environment. Um, and that's something, actually, that the, the idea of having a levy on some of the largest operators has entered the program of the, of the Labour Party, the opposition in, in, in Britain, who we have no idea but could be the government fairly soon. So that we need imaginative ways of redistributing money and using digital platforms from, from the from the bottom up. Um, so how I should end now. I, my worry is that unless we find a way to deal with the ways in which public media organizations have been and continue to be captured in terms of an unhealthy and anti-democratic association with highly unaccountable elites, public media will be unlikely to play the role that we desperately want them to have of news organizations that are willing to tackle power instead of being buried within power. Um, we need a project that doesn't just speak down to communities, but that is actually made up of the communities themselves. And I think that will involve not just a marketing strategy, and I don't particularly trust um, any uh, um, of the existing large public media, public service organizations to deliver this. This will need a wider democratic political project where this kind of new decentralized communicative capacity emerges from the bottom up, certainly not just through state mandate or just through a market mechanism. If we are to conceive, and I go back and I'm afraid I'm still ending with Raymond Williams from, again, from 50 years ago, if we conceive of a democratic communication system even in a post-digital age, which is genuinely in the hands of its users, opposed, as opposed to one that's controlled by billionaires or bureaucrats. In other words, one that Williams describes where the principle should be that the active contributors 
have control of their own means of expression, then that is going to need a wider political democratic project. And I think that takes us back to the very beginning of the talk and your foreign minister's warning not to come to the UK because there are too many protests. Because surely that's part of the, prob uh, part of the solution and not the problem. The public making its voice heard, even if it's messy and noisy and makes you late for your meetings. Um, that the public should not just be subject to the representational power of others. Now, you, want to, you might want to argue that we live in a post-digital environment, but I'd suggest that what matters more is that we live in, at best, a very fragile environment. We live in very fragile democracies, and that our communication systems reflect this fact. Um, that, they're, that they are set up to reward, above all, the powerful, not to investigate them, to commodify and exploit our personal data and not to protect our privacy, to facilitate clickbait and not complexity, to generate monopolies and not diversity. And digital implications are just as implicated in this scenario as the legacy media they superseded. So perhaps, before we go entirely post-digital, can we please sort out some of the inequalities and injustices, the corruption and the concentration, the disenfranchisement and the disengagement that has marked our com communicative experiences for way too long? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.